Welcome to Private Club Radio, your weekly source for industry education, news and discussion. Broadcasting from Tampa, Florida, ladies and gentlemen, here is your host, Gabriel Aloisi. On this episode, we're chatting with Mike Orloff of Golf Industry Central. Mike is an American now living in Australia, so he's going to give us the lowdown on what's happening down under. If you've been wondering what's trending in Australia and New Zealand, this is the episode for you. And we're also going to be chatting with Mr. Norm Spitzig on another edition of Masterclass presented by Master Club Advisors. Norm's going to be on his way to Australia and New Zealand with Greg Patterson. So we're going to talk about that. And we're going to cover tipping. Should your club do it? Should they not find out all the dirty details on this edition of Masterclass? Without further ado, we're going to bring on our first guest. My next guest is Mike Orloff. He's the Managing Director of Golf Industry Central. Golf Industry Central is the leading news and information resource for the golf industry in Astral Asia. Since 2008, they've been providing golf industry news, recruitment, marketing, and operational advice to golf-related businesses throughout Australia, New Zealand, and Southeast Asia. Mike, welcome to Private Club Radio. Thanks, Gabe. Love, Love to be here. Yeah, so first I just want to get a, uh, a reading of the pulse of what's happening in your part of the world. What's happening in the golf industry out there, Mike? Well, I, I think like many places around the world, we're, we're starting to come through um, um, and starting to see some positive signs finally with, um, with, with membership growth especially. Um, a lot of our clubs here, or most of our clubs here, are very member-focused. Uh, so member clubs, um, traditionally run volunteer um, types of types of organizations. Um, yeah, we, we saw a, a big de- decline after the GFC, and uh, a lot of clubs were, were, were struggling quite a bit. Um, most of our members here, most of our players here, are, are, are you know handicapped players. They play in competitions. They're they're a member of a club, and, and the, the 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 social aspect, I guess, what we see in especially in the U.S. isn't as um, as dominant. I guess we don't have as many public access facilities um, in comparison to over there. Um, to give you a snapshot, we have about 1.2 million players in in the Australia. Um, the size of Australia would be the size of, of uh, the United States, but. 1500 golf courses versus what 16,000 golf courses in, right. in that region. Mm-hmm. Um, New Zealand has about half a million golfers just to give you a context, but you know, probably the highest popu- uh, per capita uh, outside of Scotland with the amount of golf courses and you know, based on the, on the population. Um, so we're starting to see some, some trends. Uh, you know, I think we're, our courses are becoming a bit more commercialized. Um, we have some of the best golf courses in the world with the, you know, with the Melbourne sand belt and, and all the, the, the new developments that have been happening down in Tasmania, some very beautiful landscapes down there, some incredible facilities, um, so a very much a tourism mecca, uh, mecca um, in, in several places down here. I saw Terra E.T. just got ranked, right, as um, one yeah. of the top golf courses in the world. It's pretty pretty new, isn't it? Yes, it's uh, I think it's only second year. Um, I was fortunate to get a, a preview um, in 2016. Uh, it just you know wasn't I don't think it was quite all the way open, but uh, once again some pretty amazing landscape, um, dope design. Um, yeah, uh, American owned I think in if I remember the the history down there, Amer- American owned and a big development happening just outside of Auckland, about an hour and a half or so north of Auckland. Wow. Um, but uh, once again, yeah, and the same with Barnbugal uh, Dunes and uh, Lost Farm, Kings Island. You know, we've got some world class ones that have just opened in the last uh, last couple of years. Oh, that's fantastic! So you started this resource, Golf Industry <clears throat> Central, about ten years ago now, Mike. You're celebrating your first decade doing this. So first yep. off, congrats for for sticking with yeah, th- it so long. Get that, but, thank you. It's a it's a passion. Yeah, yeah, it's got to be. If you do anything for ten years, it's got to be a passion. So. Let's let's just go into the history of how you started that, why you started that, maybe even what brought you to that part of the world. Sure, sure. So, I like many people out there. I, I was uh, well. I'm from California originally, so you know, I'm not sure if my accent is coming through or not. If it's uh, American or or Australian, depending on yeah. You, who's I think listening. you've taken on a little bit of the Australian. I would say, yeah, yeah. But it's it's kind of in between. Yeah, it's a, a bit of a, a mutt, I think, because um, I'm originally <laughs> from Los Angeles. Uh, I came out here in, in 2000, so I've, I've had about 18 years living here. Um, during that time, or the reason, main reason I came out was um, I was working for American Golf Corporation, 
uh, at the time, um, and they were expanding out into the Australian market. So I was I was the first general manager. I ran two two resorts uh, in a place called the Gold Coast, which is on the eastern seaboard, about an hour south of Brisbane. Uh, but it's a tourism mecca. It's a uh, Miami style you know type of place with beautiful beaches, amusement parks, golf courses, a lot of outdoor activity, a lot of sporting. Mm-hmm. So I, I came over with them and managed a couple of golf courses. Um, they were at that point when American golf was sort of uh, in a retracting mode, sort of getting out of the uh, overseas uh, market. Uh, I went back and ran a property in, in Anaheim, California called Coyote Hills. Uh, during that time, I was, um, I was in conversation and, and communication with a, a beautiful Aussie girl that um, I ended up marrying. Um, we have a couple of kids and, you know, the whole, uh, almost the American dream or Australian dream in many cases. So I've, I've made this my permanent home and moved back. Um, worked for Club Corp for a couple of years uh, at a, a Nicholas facility. Um, once again, they, they retracted and sort of moved out of the overseas market. And I just said, oh, you know what, I, I just need to do something for myself. I, I'm at that the state in my career and, and age and everything, I just wanted to take on a really big challenge. And at the time, <clears throat> excuse me, at the time, um, our industry here was very fragmented. It was very much PGA versus the, the, the national body versus the superintendents. And no one really communicated that well. Uh, and I just felt there was an opportunity for um, you know, a central portal of news and information, hence Golf Industry Central. Um, and American Golf Days and Club Corp Days, we always had a, a, an intranet. We had a way of sharing information and best practice between different um, different uh, facilities. So I felt, you know, well, that's something I, I'm going to put together and start building and, and share the information. It'll help hopefully make our industry that much stronger. Off the back of that, I've been able to to provide rec- you know, recruitment work or consulting work. You know, where I earn most of my money. Yeah. Well, I love the I love the golf industry um, resource that you put together because I actually read it. I get a lot of news and information from that myself, even being over right. here in the United States. And I just think you've just done a great job. It's such a it's such a good mix of of news and announcements that are happening in the industry from all over the world, really. And then, of course, what's happening specifically in the region there. So, for folks who haven't seen it, how would you describe the resource that you've put together? I think, I think you did a pretty good job there, actually. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, it's a mixture. I mean, really, I'm handpicking things that uh, I think are important. Um, new golf courses that are being built, uh, new managers or new jobs. You know, one one income resource for us is running job adverts uh, or helping clubs, you know, find find the right people for their, their facility. Um, some of it's very dry and, you know, pe- not everybody's cup of tea, be it, you know, uh, design and such, but then you know, we have a little bit of the fun stuff. Uh, we have Top Golf that just opened up here last week, our first one in in Australia, first one in this region. Wow. Um, so we've had a lot of activity in that space, and you know, been fortunate to be out there to um, to, to see it open and and the excitement that the that all the locals are um, are, are bringing to it. Um, and we're involved with different conferences and different events uh, that we run or that we're part of. And uh, so it's just a mixture of stuff that um, I'm just passionate about and I enjoy. And I, I hopefully, you know, the, the people that are following and, and reading us, at, um, be it on social media or in newsletters, um, you know, like the same stuff. So it's, it's evolved over the, the last 10 years for sure. Yeah. It's really just a wealth of information. I invite people to check it out. Golfindustrycentral.com.au. That's the link. Make sure that you get on that website and bookmark it. Mike, the next question I have for you is, is I, we, Obviously, most of our listeners are in the United States, and in the UK would be our second market, and then Europe. So, I'd love yep. to hear some lessons from down under that they can maybe take back to their clubs. Yeah, well, it's it's a good question. Um, now, I think here that the biggest thing I see because I, I haven't worked in the UK market, but I have been following um, a lot of the other publications over there. That was one of the um, networking that I, I wanted to get together. There's there's some other great news sites in the UK. There's some great great news industry news in, in the US and trying to share between us the, the different information that that's, um, that we're seeing in our local markets. Uh, some of it relevant, some of it not. Um, for me, I, I guess I'm more um, our golf courses here are very similar more uh, they're more similar to the UK market than than the US. Um, they're volunteer run on the most part. We have 1,500 facilities, 1,500 and uh, odd uh, facilities. 500 of those would be nine-hole courses. Um, 
because we're such an expansive um, country, you know, uh, there's a lot of regional courses that are very much a community hub. And I, I guess that's what I'm seeing more here. Some of the lessons, just how that how that community um, benefits by having a golf club within their their you know their local local area. They raise grant money to put on different types of um, junior golf events and get juniors into golf and get women into golf now. So it's a real community feel, and that's something I, I guess from my background, not coming in traditional club, I've come more through a commercial uh, background. You know, that was a big uh, a learning curve, and it's something I, I've taken on to you know in what I do. You know, I just think that's something we all can learn. Is just you know, what are the other benefits? How, how does that that club benefit the you know the the, the local community? Um, and tourism is yet another part of it. So that that's probably the the biggest one that comes to mind. The other one is that you know, even from a revenue standpoint, is that we we have a lot of what's called competition golf. So people, you know, they'll they'll chip in ten dollars. Every player will put in ten or fifteen dollars, and they'll play against the field in a competition, and they win you know prizes out of that that pool of money. Uh, very very competitive here compared to the U.S. market. Um, when it comes to our golf, <laughs> yeah, really, so, it, yeah, oh, that's ex- extremely, yeah. It, it's uh, if you're not a member of your club, they, they sort of look at you funny sometimes. Like, <laughs> you know, wh- wh- where are you a member at? Um, they're very <laughs> proud of their clubs, which is great. Um, but yeah, that the whole com- competition uh, facet, you know. So you, you play, you you know, if there's 200 people in the field, there's a couple thousand dollars worth of prizes, and wow. you know, they give you balls, they give you this and that. But it gets people really active in in, in playing, and they. They win the honor board. They win, you know, get their name up in, um, you know, in perpetuity for winning some of the big events that they have on at the club. So it's very active in that 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 perspective at yeah. a lot of the clubs. I hear that Australians especially love to make wagers and bets and things. Is that true? Yeah, I would I would say to say so. There's like betting houses <laughs> uh, and I, I things all over the place, right? It's pretty pretty uh, available, yeah. isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very much. Um, uh, a lot of our clubs. Um, are uh, their community assets, but they'll have, they'll have what we call um, po- excuse me, pokey machines. So sort of the the one one arm bandit type of machines, where you go in and you know you, you throw in your coins and you might win something, um, and, and that money actually you know supports these golf clubs and these clubs in the community wow. through through some of that some of those. And there's a lot of them in, in a, a couple of the states. Really? Um, wow. Yeah. So, and then the other one being what's called. Is the is the betting? So you can go in and, and place a bet, like a lotto type of bet, where you fill out a you fill out the little cards, and you know if you get the right numbers, you win something, or you're betting against you know any of the uh, the horse races or sporting events around the world now because of the you know the internet, you can bet pretty much anywhere. So yeah, yeah, it's a very competitive country. Um, love our sport, uh, not as much gridiron, but uh, you know rugby and and uh, and. Uh, the world, uh, the soccer, you know, World uh, Cup at the moment, all yeah. that type of stuff. That's all everybody's talking about. I love our sport, sure. love our, you know, love competition. So, in in terms of you know other ways that that those clubs differ from the United States, here I know there's a lot of there's a real push for bringing the family to the club and and building, we're building the pool yeah. facilities and the fitness facilities and those sort, yeah. sorts of things. Are you seeing the same trend happening over there? Not not as much. What we tend and not to, I guess I'm being very general. I mean, we, we tend to follow behind the U.S. and, and the U.K. markets uh, when it comes to that that type of of, um, of asset um, of building. But we don't have as many golf facilities that are part of a housing development, for example. Right. I mean, they're starting to. We're starting to see more of that. Um, some of the clubhouses being rebuilt and you know uh, taken down and re- rebuilt. We, we're starting to see it, but it's not a it's not a major one. Uh, the the funds aren't quite there for for most of the golf courses. Um, a lot of the small courses don't have really any money. They haven't really done a lot with asset replacement. So you're, you know we're seeing some really um, you know facilities that are getting pretty tired. Mm-hmm. The more mo- the the top end facilities though that they are looking at long term. Um, uh, master plans and you know we have Gil Hands doing uh, Royal Sydney we have Tom Doak doing a few properties down here you know we're starting to see the real high end of the properties do that where they're putting in pools and you know uh, expanding clubhouses and, and such but it's not part of the norm you know, I think we're, we're still quite far behind so there's plenty of clubs here obviously that don't have the big budgets we hear a lot of times about the renovations that are happening at some of these clubs and you know, those are usually at the the larger clubs are putting on the big, you know, renovations. Yeah. So there's smaller yeah. clubs here that, you know, probably could use some some wisdom and guidance maybe from that part of the world on 
how you've still made golf or the club experience exciting with maybe not the big budgets. Is, is there some advice you'd have for those clubs, Mike? Yeah, well, I, that's I've been out of the U.S. for for too long. I think <laughs> so I'm not really, I'm not as uh, up to uh, speed in what's been happening over there. But uh, over here, I, I think it is a lot of that uh, that community feel where that you know they're doing um, you know social nights and we have like uh, doing meat raffles and and draws on a Friday night to get people into the club to have a, a, a fairly inexpensive dinner. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of that here, though, like I said, has been funded through through some of the gambling, through some of the the poker machine, uh, po- uh, pokey machines. Yeah. Um, so I think over there, you know, the the, the laws are, are quite different. I <laughs> well, they just I right, think they just able. like lifted the the gambling ban. Actually, just got passed about a month ago, where now gambling is kind of in a way legalized, at least sports betting. Um, so maybe okay. there's some opportunities there actually for yeah. some some clubs yeah. to get involved in uh, what's happening in, in Australia. <laughs> Yeah, de- definitely, and, and it, you know, it's a, it's a bit of a, cu- a cultural thing for us over here in, in that space. Um, we're, we are seeing some of the um, other types of activities, be it the you know the foot golf or the the big hole golf. Uh, we're seeing a lot, you know those types of things, speed golf, you know, the running running around the course. We're seeing those different types of things happening at uh, at many facilities that are mm. you know just trying to trying to attract the different different crowd. Just getting creative um, with the resources that you already have. That's that's. I think that's yeah, a great lesson. Yeah, and I think the other one, you know, we have the uh, golf sixes, so the European tour is starting to have a few more events here with our uh, Australasian uh, PGA tour. Mm-hmm. Um, so the golf sixes, where they play play normal for the first, I think it's the first two rounds, and then they go into a, an elimination sort of shootout with six holes at a time. Oh, nice. Match play. I like that. Um, so that, that yeah, so it's it's a lot more entertaining. So um, yeah. Cr- Cricket's the big sport over here, and yeah, you know, normally you'd watch cricket over five days. Um, they have a thing called um, T20, where it's or, or cricket, uh, 2020 uh, cricket, where they just um, they play within one night and they just hit back and forth. It's sort of a faster, faster version of the game, and it's a lot better for the spectator um, to to watch it. It's more entertaining than over five days, for example. Mm-hmm different demographics. So similar to that, you know, having these, you know, golf sixes or, you know, different, um, versions of the, of the, of the, of the format that they're playing in the pro pro levels, you know, is, is a, they're trying it, they're trying it out and see if they, they can. We've also just had an announcement for our Australian open, which is our, our big national event that, uh, run by the national body here, golf Australia. And they're going to have the, um, uh, inclusive players involved th- uh, this coming year with you know, people that have, um, you know, maybe missing an arm or leg or, you know, they've got prosthetic legs and arms. They're going to play wow. within the actual Australian Open, not in the same event, but they'll play side by side in the, you know, the, the, the national event. So they're, they're, they're trying to become a lot more inclusive yep. and allow other people coming in, which is right. It's a big move. And I don't think any other countries has done that. Yeah, um, that's or, fascinating. Or so hopefully we're leading in, you know, leading in that space. I can send you some information on it if you... Yeah, I'd love to see that, that for sure. And I'm sure you've got some of that stuff on your website as well. Um, that's fascinating. Yeah. I love that. I think the, the more inclusive that the sport can be, the, the better it's going to be for everyone. Um, so after 10 years, obviously, you've seen lots of you know news stories or trends and things happening. What are some of the highlights of the last 10 years that, that's gotten you really excited, Mike? Well, I, I think the inclusive golf is one. <laughs> um, it, it's it's been good to see our our uh, national bodies starting to work a lot closer together. That's um, I mean, hence, uh, part of the reason I called it Golf Industry Central was ten year, ten twelve years ago, our industry was was fragmented. They weren't really working close together. There wasn't mm-hmm. anywhere to get you know the information that's out there uh, that people wanted. Um, so seeing these, the, the different national bodies and state bodies are starting to work closer together. They're, they're aligning, um, they're looking at their, their operational structure and make some changes in that space. So, you know, from, from, you know, I guess my industry nerdy, um, perspective, you know, it, it's something good to see. It's a, it's a very positive growth for, for the industry as a whole. Um, if they are working together, you know, we, yeah. have, we have limited resources and, you know, um, it's better that, you know, we're, we're more efficient and, and, uh, and all working toward a common goal versus working for individual goals. Yep. So I Absolutely. think that's, you know, it's just good. That's fantastic. So this question, next question comes from one of our show listeners and friends. He's actually been a guest on the show. His name's Leighton Walker. And he wanted yeah. to ask you, Mike, why do the best managers come from that part of the world? From Australia? Yes. 
What, which, it's kind of a tongue in cheek <laughs> joke because he's from Australia. <laughs> yeah. No, I know, I know, like that's why. He didn't actually ask oh. that. That's my own question. <laughs> oh, okay. That's, oh, no. You get me in trouble on this one. Yeah, oh, oh, that's an interesting question. I don't know. It, it, it's uh, we're we're evolving. We're we're getting some really good good GMs coming out here now because they're. I, I think we're getting some of the younger ones coming too. Um, yeah, you know, we have some very traditional GMs that have been in the area. Have done some great things. Uh, and like anything, you know, we see our, our um, you know, we're having this big shift in our our, our, uh, our demographics. So mm -hmm. with that shift is also new, younger. Um, I'm feeling old at 50 nowadays. You know, looking back <laughs> at some of the people coming through. Now. Sure. Uh, but yeah, they're just more tech savvy. They're just you know a lot more modern. But um, on the one hand, our uh, a lot of our members and our, our product, the people that we're trying to um, to look after, are um, you know, are, are still older, but um, but very aged. You know, to, just it's the same same trends anywhere around the world. You know, we yeah. have a very aged pop population of golfers. How do we attract the new ones? Well, you know, it, 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 the the new uh, fresh managers will bring them in. What specific things are they doing to attract younger members in Australia and New Zealand? Yeah, with with the um, Australia, New Zealand, different age membership. So you know, there, there's an age. Uh, I'm trying to think of how it is in the states. You know, you might have a member, a junior up to 18, and then from mm -hmm. 18 to 21 will be a different membership category. Yeah, uh, and then 21 to 25, and 25 to 30. So there's a few of those ones that used to be at the mid 20s used to go to full membership cost. Our, mm -hmm. our membership here is fairly inexpensive by U.S. terms. Um, and, you know, it's one of the challenges we have is that, you know, some of these are running costs that these properties keep increasing, but we're unable to push the uh, dues line up by much, yeah. by CPI or whatever. So, we, you know, we've got this uh, upward pressure. We have a very high um, uh, payroll cost here. It's probably oh. double what we would use in, in the States because, you know, we, our minimum wage, you know, you're looking at $18 an hour, for example, you know, you can have the, that's the currency conversion, but, you know, still be $15, $16 an hour mm -hmm. equivalent. Yeah. That's, um, that's so high. you got a lot of that pressure. Yeah. You have a lot of staff costs that are going up, but you can't charge more for the clubs, um, or charge more for your members. So we, they have sort of this, um, you know, tiered approach at a lot of facilities now where, you know, under 40 will be another rate and you're not paying the full, you know, full fare that you would as a member. And then when you get to another age where you're, you know, you should be, you know, um, you know fully have the time and the money, then, then it goes to full, full fee. It just, it's sort of uh, tiered upward based mm -hmm. around the age. Are you seeing a lot of technology <clears throat> come into clubs down there as well? Like I know here, a lot of clubs are put, you know, bringing in mobile applications. They're yep. doing more things with their <clears throat> booking systems and booking engines. Yep. Same thing happening over there. Yeah, yeah, but very much. With uh, especially the last probably three or four years, we're seeing a lot more of the uh, the apps type of stuff coming into this market. Uh, online booking T sheets have been around for a while. Um, yeah, I work with a couple of one of the companies that's um, one of the main ones up here that that do that. Um, you know, doing the, 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 the discount side, sort of the golf now, you know, we've got, you know, that, that equivalent over here. Golf, golf now is actually in our market now. It just came in this, this last year. Um, and they work with our, uh, Qantas airlines, which is oh, our, um, nice. our, our, our main provider. So that they're mm -hmm. building a club and getting access and getting special, special things for their players. But I think golf now is building that uh, international tea time platform. Um, so anywhere and anywhere you want to go play, you, you'll be able to find it on there. Wow. Um, so that that type of stuff's around. That the, the IT systems, you know, the the back end, all that's pretty pretty modern. It's you know, it's come forward a lot in the last last five years, which has been great. That's been a big help, a help for because um, you you have a better a better efficiencies and you know uh, you don't have have three staff doing a job of one type yeah. of thing. So it's uh, <laughs> so it's been been better in that standpoint. You can focus more on service. Uh, that's great. So, yeah, that's, yeah, no, the that, key. that's all that that's all dominating. Yeah, as dominating t tourism marketing, you know, for a few of our regions. Like I said earlier, we have some incredible golf uh, golf facilities and, and destinations through through many of our states, um, and some very high high ranking international and, and local rank, ranked golf courses. Um, so I think from a bucket list, it's a it's a good one. The only challenge is uh, we're so far away. <laughs> From uh, from America or from England, it's a, a very very long trip to come out here. 
Uh, so if, if your readers can get over that mindset of uh, it's 14 hours or you know 18 hours from Florida, uh, yeah, yeah, I think we'll have more more of the Yanks <laughs> coming over. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, that just means that they have to stay longer. When I go to that part of the yeah. world, I, I'm they're going to be there for two or three weeks minimum. Exactly, or else it's not even worth coming. <laughs> it, no, it, it, exactly right. Luckily, you have such it, a yeah. wealth of of wonderful properties there that I I think I could keep myself busy for a little bit. <laughs> De- definitely. Yeah. yeah. So, Mike, I know you're heavily involved with education down under and would love to find out more about some of the opportunities that folks might have out there. Yeah, no, th- thanks, Dave. Yeah, there, it's um, the second half of our year. We're, we're in winter right now, being middle of July. So we're, you know, we're not that cold compared to, to some, of this, um, some, some of the states up there. Uh, but we, our second half of the year is when we have most of our events on. We, uh, we have uh, Greg Patterson and Norm Spitzig coming out for a 10-day roadshow uh, through six cities um, on the second half of July. Uh, if you happen to be in the country, you're more than welcome to come to one of them. Um, and we have a golf business forum, which is more of like your national golf association type of forum. It's a two-day one, more commercial focus that we're involved with as a media partner. That's in Melbourne at the end of July. Um, I think some of you may be coming out to Queenstown in early October for the, for the New Zealand event, uh, the New Zealand BMI event. I think it's a sold out with 50 managers from North America coming. Wow. Uh, there's, a, there's a Golf Managers Association of New Zealand event that sort of backs up to that one. Um, so if you're out for that, maybe stick out a, a couple extra days. Queenstown is an amazing city. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. That's, that's most of the, the, the industry ones that are that are coming up. Um, so we do have those. It's a good time to plan a trip down here around one of those. Write it off as a business expense. It's October, November, December. You know the weather's starting to get nicer. Uh, November is a beautiful, beautiful uh, time of year as well. November, December. So yeah, we'd love love to see some more of our American friends down here. Drop me a line. I'm happy to uh, show you around or whatever if you're if we're in the same city for sure. Awesome, Mike. Well, I really appreciate you having on the show, sharing what's happening down under. And if folks want to get a hold of you, Mike, or learn more about you, how should they do that? Uh, probably easiest way would be be the website, so um, uh, golfindustrycentral.com.au or an email to mike at golfindustrycentral.com.au, either one. Um, but we're on, I'm on most of the social media platforms, so you'll be able to find us. Mike, thank you so much for joining us on Private Club Radio. That, yeah, thanks very much, Gabe. And now, it's time for your monthly masterclass, presented by Master Club Advisors. Well, my guest today on Masterclass is Norm Spitzig of Master Club Advisors. Norm's going to talk to us a little bit about tipping. But before we get into that, Norm, I wanted to get a little detail from you on your trip down under. Can you tell folks what's going on? I sure can. Uh, first off, it's always great to talk with you. Uh, you know, we have a, a good time together, and I really enjoy the exchange of information and our camaraderie and all kinds of good stuff. So it's, it's always fun. Likewise. Uh, Greg Patterson and I are having our return. The boys are back in town visit uh, to Australia. We went uh, two years ago. We actually were in Australia and New Zealand and visited four or five cities. And this time it's expanded. We're going to five different cities. We have about eight or nine talks planned, maybe ten some private consulting. Uh, Mike Orloff, who's an American who lives there and is runs a, a website and, and service called Golf Industry Central, is uh, a friend of ours. He married an Aussie girl a long time ago and stayed there. And the uh, three of us travel around, and we've got some really good topics planned. We're talking a lot about service and culture and something I think you might be interested in, membership marketing. Yeah. <laughs> How, how are we, you know, what's going on in the U.S.? And I actually got you listed on a slide uh, referring to your book. Cause, you All know, right. I'm a big fan of Thank that. Thank you. But, uh, no, Greg and I really have a good time. And, and Mike joins us, and we just get to see a lot of friends. Um, I think what made this all go together is that um, there's a conference in Cairns called Outside Insights. And um, Colleen Okafran heard us speak two years ago on our first tour and uh, she's the booking agent for this particular group in Queensland, and she she booked us early, and that really kind of became the focal point and allowed us to go there um, socially and financially. So Greg and I are the co-moderators. Uh, we have the keynote speech, and just of late, we learned we're also sort of introducing the other speakers and you know commenting on the speakers and all that. So that would be nice. a really great uh, experience. So we're really excited about it. Um, as I said, we have a good time and. Uh, I've posted a lot about it on LinkedIn, and if you haven't checked, check it out. And if you're one of my LinkedIn friends in Australia, I'd better see you there. 
<laughs> for sure. You think the, the Aussies and the Kiwis are ready for you and Greg Patterson? That's that's some serious energy coming. Well, we went two years ago and we got invited back. So I, I hope <laughs> something, they are. Something I mean, was right. <laughs> yeah, you know, Greg is so much fun to travel with and, and I don't think I'm exactly a wallflower, but maybe compared to Greg, I am. <laughs> no, he's so he's so energetic, and yeah. you know, we we really I think interact well, and we have fun building on each other. So it'll be fun, and hopefully, people will learn a few things, and we'll learn some things as well. How cool! Yeah, I wish I could see some of that. Uh, so definitely check that out. Go to over to Golf Industry Central if you want more details. And as Norm mentioned, LinkedIn. Both Mike and Norm are posting quite a bit about it. You might see some videos of Greg Patterson. I saw one about a week ago, him teasing uh, the uh, sessions. So definitely check that out. Now, Norm, one of the reasons you do so much speaking is because you're very prolific. You've written a number of books in the private club industry. And inside some of those books, you've actually tackled the subject of tipping. And you do it in a really funny, humorous way. But I'd love to get some of your thoughts here on today's masterclass about tipping. Can you go into that with us? I sure can. Uh, thank you. I think it's a, an interesting topic. Um, what uh, sort of brought it to the forefront in the last couple of weeks is I got a call from a club president who had read the article and uh, lost it. And uh, through some joint efforts on his part and my part, we resurrected it. And, and uh, um, he was really uh, impressed with, I guess, the approach I have. I, I think tipping is one of these giant straw man issues that club boards love to talk about. And we get in heated discussions on both sides. We don't even know why we're arguing with each other. I mean, I've lived it when I managed Fort Wayne Country Club. I had people who thought tipping was the best thing since sliced bread and people who also thought tipping was, you know, an inherent evil. And and and, and I really don't think it's that, that big of an issue. Um, the people who are against tipping, of course, say that the people who uh, – tip will get better service than people who do not. Well, well of course they will. <laughs> that's, that's human nature. That's kind of the way it works. Right. And so you, you got to take a hard look at your club culture and say, you know, what are we really about? Um, what happens though, is that if you ban tipping and you're not really thoughtful or don't have the deep pockets to um, pay the service for their lost income or whoever gets tipped, what happens is, is it's human nature. Uh, the servers um, say, look, why should I work extra hard? Because I'm getting the same money as this crummy new server who started here. I'm not going to do it. We all descend to the same level, level of mediocrity. So I think the idea of eliminate tipping often causes service to get bad. So, so what do you do to fix that? Well, I think you take a hard look at your club culture and you say, look, we really don't like tipping. And I'm fine with that. But then what are you going to do to compensate for that? Well, one, you've got to pay the servers um, uh, what they would have earned had they made tips. Uh, in any in any case, so you have to pay a competitive wage. But more importantly, you've got to have some system in place where you reward the people who give better service, not necessarily by tenure, but by a combination of tenure and performance where you, you know, objectively evaluate them. I'm okay with that. But you just build that into the budget. You don't, you know, allow tipping, and then I guess you, you know, you charge higher dues. Um, I think another thing that really used to bug me all the time, and this happened to me at Fort Wayne Country Club, is I'd have people get on their soapbox and say, "Look, we can't have tipping in the dining room because that, you know, leads to the problems I just talked about." But hey, it's okay to tip the valets, and it's okay to tip the locker room shoe guy because it's always been that way. Well, you know, employees are not stupid. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they know everybody knows who's getting tipped and who's not. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, you you got you got to be consistent if you're going to um, uh, allow tipping. I think you got to really kind of allow it across the board and deal with that and the consequences. And again, I'm saying there's there's some downsides to that too. I get it, but if you're going to ban tipping, then you got to be smart and ban it for everybody. And again, pay people properly. Um, I don't think it's that any more complex than that is an issue. What I think it is, is that people like everything, they want to ban tipping, uh, but they certainly don't want to raise wages enough to compensate for it. So I'd be interested in hearing what you think, you know, what, what, what are your thoughts on tipping and club? Am I way off base or is that too simplistic? You know, I'm, what do you think? Yeah. Um, in my own club, the tipping is included. And one thing that I guess is strange about that is because it's a service charge, it then gets taxed afterwards. So, in a way that sort of bugs me a bit because I buy, let's say a Gatorade or a 
crackers or candy bar or something, which, you know, should be like a buck 50 and it ends up being like three fifty when all said and done. <laughs> and I don't know, something about because, being taxed on top of the service charge to me just doesn't make sense. Yeah. See, I, I don't like that either. I, I've never, maybe it's just me, but I've never really seen a system that, you know, is fair. I, I, at your particular club, we're certainly not, you know, outing them or anything, but right. do they, um, you know, one way or the other, but does that service charge go directly to individual servers? Does it go to a pool to offset wages? You know, there's a hundred ways to do it. Yeah. I'm not a hundred percent sure. I think it goes to a pool, but um, okay. I'm not a hundred percent sure about that. And then I almost always right. kind of feel guilty, like, cause I'm, you know, I would say I'm a pretty good tipper. Um, usually at a restaurant, I'm like a 20% tipper for instance. So then I always kind of feel like since the tip line's still there, cause like, you know, they, they tell you the tip and then there's a line for like the additional tip. And then I always feel bad yeah. leaving that blank because it's like, I don't want to feel them to feel like I'm stiffing them. And it's just kind of this awkward thing. Um, at least for yeah, me, and maybe so. that's just me. <laughs> I don't know. No, actually I think it is, you know, and while we're on the subject of tipping, I guess it's, you've, you've got my blood boiling about some things. You know how restaurants of late, and I've seen it in some clubs now in the last couple of years where they print out the ones that encourage tipping and they'll, they have like the amount, I guess they assume we're all math, mathematically challenged. It'll yeah. say 18% tip is, you know, $7 and 28 cents or right. 20% one is this. Um, I don't know. I Am I just dumb for being offended by that? If you give me good <laughs> service, I'm going to give you a great tip. Yeah. But don't, don't predetermine what you think you're going to get. I, I right. just don't like that. I don't know. I went to a conference over the weekend. There was all these food trucks and every single one of them where I used my card, it's right there on the window. Okay. Like, do you want to tip 15%, 20%, 25% <laughs> or write your own in? And that becomes problematic. So gun to my head, I think I, I prefer the clubs that there's just no tipping, honestly. Um, but like, as you said, then maybe people aren't trying to do their best because they know that, well, I don't know. I, I, I honestly, honestly don't know. That's why I'm glad you're on here, Norm. <laughs> well, no, it's, it's, it's a great issue. And, and I think what we're doing is making people think about the pros and cons of it. What used to get yeah. me mad in my managerial days and even in my consulting days now is that people immediately draw a line and it's like you're either you're either a Trump favorite or a Trump resistor. There's no, right. there's no discussion anymore. And, and tipping yeah. is a little bit like that too, Yeah, um, totally can be. which really, really bugs me. And again, there's, I, I get both sides. I'll give you an example of somebody who know who does it well. And there are a lot of clubs to do, you know, our friend, the Goswami who runs uh, Frenchman's Creek, you know, there's absolutely no ticking, tipping there. And there really is no tipping. There are repercussions to mem your membership status if you're caught tipping. Wow. But they pay their employees a very competitive wage. They're very selective in hiring people to fill those positions because the people are getting a good wage. There's competition for it. And so I think people then really get good service. In addition, if you're a superstar, you get a bonus based upon, you know, a, a metric that you fulfill um, after being evaluated by your um, you know, your supervisor. And I, I, I just think that's really the simple, simplest way to do it. That, that one I really love. Um, I've been going to Manhattan quite a bit last year, especially. And a lot of the, the trend there is, is restaurants where there's no tipping, they pay a you know, fair wage and whatnot. And I feel yep. like the service is just as good, if not better, because people just like where they work. And I love the idea of bonusing. I mean, I think that's genius where, you know, you're basically you're you're giving people an incentive to do their best always, but then the members aren't in that awkward That's do right. I tip, do I not tip? It's awkward for the members. I always throw a really monkey wrench into it. A couple member last year, the year before, the city of Seattle uh raised the minimum wage to fifteen percent. This was their attempt uh excuse me, to fifteen dollars an hour. The minimum wage went wherever it was to fifteen dollars an hour. And the actual income of people who work in the restaurant industry as servers, waiters, waitresses went down significantly since that time. Because the people are going in and say, holy moly, you work in a donut shop and you're making 15 bucks an hour, I ain't tipping you anymore. <laughs> right. So it's really interesting. You know, it was well yeah. intentioned to make them some more money. But a lot of people said, I'm not, I'm just not doing this. this is McDonald's or you're right. I'm just not giving you any money. Wow. And so it actually went down. Of course, there was government at work. So we're not going to go there. <laughs> we're not going to go there. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, so, it's, and then you anyway, the, the point of all this is it, it's a complex issue that, yeah. you know, as I said, and you said that requires, you know, thought and sort of a dispassionate discussion on both sides and then understand your club culture, the amount of money people have, what you've done in the past, um, you know, and come to a clear policy that affects all the employees, not just 
some in one department and some in, in not other ones in other departments because you don't think it's there. Yep. Sage advice, Norm, for sure. And that's why people should contact you when they're looking for advice. You guys do a fantastic job, not only doing your executive searches, but advising clients on issues just like this. So recommend folks check out masterclubadvisors.com. Norm and his partner, Gary, two amazing individuals who are not just here every month, but they're actually out there doing their thing. So I really appreciate you guys coming on every month, sharing your wisdom. Norm, thanks so much for joining us on Private Club Radio. Good. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it as always. Well, there's your dose of Australian New Zealand news. I want to get there. If you ever see the pictures of New Zealand, man, that place is spectacular. Australia doesn't look too shabby either. I got to plan a trip. That's my thing. I love to travel. That's my jam. All right, it's time for me to get out of here. I got to get to the beach. I'll catch you back here next week. Until then, here's to your membership success. Private Club Radio is brought to you by Concert Golf Partners, helping to preserve and enhance private golf and country clubs. Concert Golf has the capital, expertise and private club hospitality experience to help upscale private clubs achieving long-term success and membership growth. For 25 years, Concert Golf has allowed private club members to focus on simply enjoying their club. Visit ConcertGolfPartners.com to learn more about the recapitalization process.